Well, grace and peace to everyone. It is a blessing to be here with each and every one of you. So today, we're going to talk about a pretty pivotal chapter in God's Word from, from my perspective. And I pray that each of you would spend a tiny bit of time contemplating it even after to sort of to sort of pull out what might have been there that I don't bring up. So a lot of you know that I, I grew up in a country that loved revolutions. They loved revolutions. They could not handle the thought of being under a ruler when there might be something better for them somewhere else. So in the 18 years I spent in Ecuador, Ecuador went through 10 presidents. So that's about one president every 1.8 years. And, and, the st and as a child, you would know when the people were unhappy. You'd start to sense something very, very distinct in the streets. There would be sort of a stirring, and people would be peeking out their windows and peeking out their curtains. And then all of a sudden, people would start to, to march in the streets, and they'd start lighting tires on fire, and there would be smoke in the air. And then you could st start to sense the tear gas, the tear gas in the air from the police being deployed to sort of calm down the people. And this happened, I think it happened around nine times in my childhood where the people would rise up and they'd demand something different. They'd say, we're not satisfied with this. We're not satisfied with our government. We're not satisfied with, with the way that life is. And a lot of the times, the people had sort of a claim to the revolution. They had some sort of justification to why they were marching. Sometimes the president had raised the prices of public transportation. One time a president stole a bunch of money and so the people demanded that he leave the country. But in God's story we see something very very different where one of the saddest realities is that God's people demanded that he make a king of man instead of himself when he had done absolutely nothing wrong and the people of God lost all trust in him. And when we're thinking about revolutions as a people of God and we're thinking about the conditions to when God's people demanded a king, we should be thinking, what were those conditions? What was it that led God's people to, to move from a theocracy to be under God's rule to a monarchy? Because even though all of you know the end of the story, there's still a constant danger of trying to escape a rule that we're not satisfied with. So today we're going to go over the story of when man dethroned God, one of the greatest falls, I think, that Israel has ever made. So what, when, I, when you're reading this, I want you to start to think, what is the scene like? What are the conditions? How can we as a people know what to look for and how to avoid this pivotal moment? So will everyone turn with me to 1 Samuel? We're going to start in chapter 7, verse 15. 1 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 15. And then we're going to read the next chapter as well. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people 
in all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the way of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and all and your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because your king, whom, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. So let's, uh, let's pray before we get into this. Father, we, uh, we're before you today and we are... We look upon this, these words that happened what seems to be so long ago, but in all reality, these are our spiritual ancestors that, that we have just read about. These are real people, and they mean so much to us because they have taught us about you and they have taught us about, about us as a people as well, Lord. God, we seek to, to pursue righteousness, to understand how to operate in the world around us when there seem to be so many distractions and, and stories and just it's, it's hard to know where to, to put all of our time and effort. God, we, we love you and we love your word. We, we consecrate this time to you to, to understand it and to be a faithful people before you. God, may we never repeat the lessons of the past. And in your son's name, we pray these things. Amen. So, what, what was it in the air when this story happened. Did any of you catch one of the first lines in the story? What was the, the, the condition to when man dethroned God? And I want to posit that when man dethroned God, family had failed. Did you notice in verse 1 how all of this starts? When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. This fall starts with family. A lot of people might not notice that, but it's, it's not new in the Old Testament. The story of absent fathers and failed children can be found in Gideon, in Eli, in Samuel, in David. There's something very, very strong noticing that although a father can walk in the ways of the Lord, if he's absent, he doesn't necessarily pass it to his children. Also, we notice, did you, did you he read anything about Samuel's son's mothers? They are also absent in this story, as opposed to very, very contrasted with how Hannah, in the beginning of Samuel, prays fervently and dedicates Samuel to God. So, this fall starts with a father failing his children, and a mother's absence in prayer. Samuel's, Samuel's success before this can't be separated from those very, very two powerful notions of family. Fathers. I know that when I have pictured myself young, I, I always look at my current state and I think, 
well, look how I turned out. Whatever is going on and whatever happened in my life, it must be justified if I can end up the way I do, I did right now. But we shouldn't be saying that at all. Did, maybe Samuel was thinking this, the exact same thing. Maybe he was thinking, well, Elkanah was absent in my life. Therefore, I don't necessarily need to be present in my children's life in order to make them follow after God. But look what happens. We see both of his children. We see Joel and we see Abijah, and they fall away. So just because you, or we as fathers, turn out following the Lord, we shouldn't be able to justify the shortcomings of our own childhood. It should be no surprise in the New Covenant, in 1 Timothy 3, that managing the household well is one of the pivotal moments for the leaders of God's church. We see it tied directly to one of the biggest falls in the people of God when they choose outside when they choose a man over God. Israel's rebellion is born out of this fa failure in the family. Amen. Secondly, when man dethroned God, man wanted to be like the nations. A lot of people ha have said that the kingdom Christianity has two bookends to it. Does anyone know what those are? Has anyone heard that? Two bookends. I've heard it said, nonconformity and non-resistance are the bookends to kingdom Christianity. This is helpful to me, but in my mind, I think strongly that non-resistance non hangs on nonconformity. Nonconformity is one of the hardest things to, to sort of weed out and keep your, keep your finger on and to pay attention to. Want this, this notion, it, we, we see it twice in this chapter, wanting to be like all the nations. If you ever hear that in your household, if you ever hear that in your church, I want you to think that's the equivalent of taking a sewage pipe, sticking it in your house, and then turning it on and filling everything with sewage. That's what we should be thinking when, when we see the world around us and we're thinking to ourselves, oh, look what, look what they're doing. I want to be just like them. I want to be following the trends. And in the New Covenant, we see multiple warnings about this. In Romans 12, 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. James 4, 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. It's only a matter of time before the church sort of looks at the world and wants to be like it, that everything is going to fall, whether it be politics, whether it be entertainment, whether it be laws on marriage, whether it be laws on, on all of these different things that we, you could possibly imagine. It's wars. It's current events. It's social platforms. We shouldn't want to be like the world as a church. Amen. Whatever it may be, however innocent it appears, if it is outside of God's perspective, it can undo you. It can creep in. So it's our job as a church of God to keep it out in order to prevent the similar trends that we see here in 1 Samuel. Another interesting, shocking point for me in this story is when man dethroned God, God stepped down as king. Can you, can you really imagine being Samuel and having a conversation with God about the request of a people to replace an all-perfect creator with dirt, essentially dirt, that, is, that God had breathed himself into? And I think that this moment in itself is one of the strongest indications that we have free will as a people. God, unlike so many rulers of history, didn't impose his will on his people and he freely just let them, let them sort of walk away. And he said, you know what, Samuel? Whatever they ask for, you give it to them. Just give them, give them some warnings 
before you do it and whatever they say I'm gonna heed I'm gonna heed the voice of the people perhaps one of the greatest signs of humanity is when we see these rulers trying to maintain power when they have overstayed their welcome this is not God's character God God is so much more powerful than to to cling to to power and to rule when the people underneath him don't want it so we 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 see here that when we describe God God as a people a lot of times when I was little the three words that were taught to me from God was omniscient omnipotent and omnipresent those were drilled into me as a child God is omniscient omnipotent and omnipresent he is all-powerful all-knowing and he is everywhere but this omnipotence is actually a very dangerous concept for us to to think about as a people of God because God right here in this story he says I'm, I'm giving you my power I've placed it in your hands I've placed the things that I can do into your hands for you to choose for yourself so our will comes from this power that God has endowed us with and and the two kingdom doctrine this runs strong it runs very strong we should never forget the burden that is upon our own our own shoulders and God even though it's I'm sure it, it was not easy he'll give us what we ask for even though it is not his intention another point when man dethroned God man refused to listen here's a list of the things that Samuel warned the people that they would lose their sons their daughters their land their food their workers their best young men their flocks their freedom that's an all-encompassing list if I have ever heard one if you if you take a bit of time and you read through the implications of what Samuel is warning the people against he's saying this is going to happen and sure enough later on in 1 Samuel 12 all of Samuel's warnings come to pass and all exchange for what in verse 20 it says they exchange all of those things that we may be like all the nations and that our king would judge us and go out and fight our, bat our battles I think this might be the worst bargain that anybody has ever really made in the Old Testament. We see that the people wanted something tangible, something they could just touch and say, uh, I need a king that I can see with my own two eyes in order that he can go and fight for me because I, I just want to be like other people. And right in this moment, we see that the people refuse to listen to Samuel. So when when man dethroned God, there were warnings and the people weren't listening. I've heard this argument over and over in some of the churches that I've been to. If it gets people in the door, what's the big deal if it isn't hurting anyone? So when we, when we think to this, when we think about this is, if it, if it gets, if we can just compromise a tiny little bit and get someone to come to our church meeting it's all worth it it's gonna be okay it's worth it to sort of refuse to listen to the commandments of the New Testament if there is a, a benefit of attracting more people to us I think this is one of the clearest warnings is that we can never compromise the new the commandments of the New Testament based on some calculus that we think it might produce some some good outcome we uh, we need to stray and walk really far away from it when it comes to government everyone you except for I don't know about our church tends to be obsessed with their safety their physical comfort but it's completely irrelevant in the framework of God but also there there, there seems to be really good news in this story about when man dethroned God because when man dethroned God Jesus reclaims the throne 
This is one of the most poetic instances I, I can see in the whole New Testament. This is the gospel. The gospel comes about closing this chapter in Israel's deep history and the gospel of Jesus' kingship. It's more poetic than anything we write and it reclaims the cosmic mistake that Israel made when they dethroned God. Yet rather than abandon us when Israel demanded a king, God sent a perfect king. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? Before his birth, the angel had told Mary, The Lord God will give him to the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. When Philip brought his brother Nathanael to see Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, Nathanael said, Rabbi, are you the Son of God? You are the King of Israel. Jesus himself speaks of a kingdom of God as his kingdom. He rides like a king into Jerusalem, Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which happens to be today, if anyone is paying attention, on Palm Sunday, and he is charged by his enemies with forbidding tribute to Caesar because he is the true king. He admits to Pilate that he is a king, and he is crucified under the, under the inscription, the king of the Jews. The faith of the early church was that after the resurrection of Jesus took, took the throne at the right hand of God and now rules as king until his enemies are put under his feet. Man dethroned God and Jesus reclaims the throne. This is, one of the, this is one of the best loops that has ever been closed in an open loop of a story. So the question, we must beg the question to ourselves, since God reclaimed the throne, will we serve Jesus as a king? I know that many of you probably didn't grow up hearing the, the, the title king attached to Jesus. And I became obsessed with this when I first entered the church. I couldn't say the, I couldn't say the name Jesus without saying King Jesus Amen. because I, I, had, I had realized that in all of my years that I had been taught that he was simply a savior, sim simply a good man to follow and that he loved me so clearly but when you forget about his kingship, it drastically changes the way that you serve him. That's right. So I pray that today, this will be a reminder to you, even though you probably, you, you're not the audience that needs to hear this as much as many other people do, but Jesus is king and he reclaimed the throne that Israel, Israel gave up when they dethroned God. And God, rather than walked away, rather than walk away, he was faithful. He was persistent through all of the kings. We look at Saul. We look at David. We look at Solomon. We look at the two kingdoms that were divided. All of the kings. And yet God, when he sends Jesus, the descendant of David, he closes the loop. And we as a people should be perked up and we should say, this is the gospel of, two, this is the gospel of Jesus' kingship reclaimed. It started here in 1 Samuel when we left it and it ends with Jesus. Brother Matthew, last year he gave a sermon titled Voting, an Abdication of Responsibility. And he laid out some of the most compelling reasons why Christians should maintain their separation as citizens of Jesus' kingdom and not throw up our hands in the air when, the, when things are amiss and claim that they're in the hands of the government. Do you remember that, that sermon? That sermon struck me because we as Christians, sometimes we have a draw to the government. We have a draw to politics. We have a draw to be safe. We have a draw to be comfortable. But at the end of the day, our responsibility to Jesus' kingdom goes much, much further beyond just voting. What are the things that we can pay a lot of attention to as Christians that maybe isn't our domain? We should be thinking of that to ourselves. What is 
the realm of Jesus' kingdom? And when do I, as a Christian, step out of it and begin to invest my time in things that I shouldn't be doing? Voting is, voting is a start, but there are many other things that I would argue that we need to be conscious of, conscious of saying, this isn't our realm. Our realm is, is no longer in the politics of the world. So since God reclaimed the throne, we as a people have a responsibility to keep our families strong. Fathers, whatever your life may look like now, don't be absent in your children's life. No matter how good the outcome was, we need to be saying, if we let our children slip, when, and my life, when my life is over, the church could slip again as it did in 1 Samuel. Mothers, please keep praying for your children. This is one of the best things that we could possibly do for our children, for Samuel. We see the implications it had during the life of Samuel, and we see now that if we stop praying for our children, then we're in grave, grave danger. Since God reclaimed the throne, we need to be comparing ourselves to the world, comparing ourselves to where we're conforming and where we shouldn't be. Do we want to be entertained? Do we want to be bow down to the metrics of the world's success? Do we accept the trends? Or do we stand firm in the commands of the New Testament? No matter what the allure, whatever the world presents it, us, if it seems innocent, let's not let it in and let's keep the church pure. Let's not want to be like the nations. Whatever. It, it, could be, it could be anything. It's one of these things that I would love to brainstorm with everyone afterwards to think to ourselves. Where is it where the world can creep in and where we have blind spots? I know I have many blind spots and we need to be stepping up as brothers and filling in each other's blind spots. Be eyes for our brothers when they can't see and our sisters. Since God has reclaimed the throne, listen and give warnings. Where do we spend our money? Where do we spend our time? Where do our thoughts dwell? Where are the areas in our life where we're willing to succumb to earthly logic? Are we willing, are we willing to take shortcuts? Are we willing to tell white lies to make ourselves feel better? I would love it, again, if we step up in a church and we start speaking into the areas of each other's life where we see danger. I, as a young person, one of the greatest benefits I've received from the brotherhood is when they say, listen, you're young and I see this in you. Don't drift, I see the danger here. Set up a guard. Your ego is getting too big in this area. Set up a guard, stop caring about this. Once it was said, if, if we as Christians care about the way we look, we can never per possibly serve Jesus is king. Do we actually believe that? I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes I, I begin to wonder because innately our human nature tends to care a lot about ourselves. Since God reclaimed the throne, it is now our duty, as all of you know, to serve Jesus only as king. There's a pervasive gospel going around that Jesus is Savior, but there is not a pervasive gospel going around that Jesus is Savior and Lord. We need to stand and fill that gap where others aren't filling it. We need to be having dialogues with, our, with people who profess to be Christians who fail to acknowledge us. No matter how many men a country can choose to lead itself, the doctrine of two kingdoms rings loudest in the context of this whole biblical narrative. I want to read a quote that many of you have probably read before, but a man named or Origen said, we recognize in each state the existence of another national organization that was founded by the word of God. And we exhort those who are mighty in word and blameless life and of blameless life to rule over churches it is not for the purpose of escaping public duties that Christians decline, decline public offices. Rather, it is so they may reserve themselves for the more divine and necessary service in the Church of God for the salvation of men. Two Kingdoms is a, th 
a notion that is very hard to wrap your mind around when you first hear it. I know it was for me. I know it, it took a lot of work to, to weed out how it seems illogical to give up the structures that are around us. But there is no greater calling than to serve the church which Jesus is enthroned above if we believe that it, it can produce the salvation of men that God promises. Amen. May we be constantly reminded today that where our spiritual ancestors failed and they chose to be slaves to the world, slaves to a man, where they crowned themselves with a crown of dirt, that we no longer have to be through Christ. May we look at verses like Galatians 4.7 that says, Wherefore thou art no more a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Our revolution is finished. There's no more, no more kings to be, to be thrown out. We have a perfect king. We have a perfect way. Now it's time to live it until the day we die or until the Lord returns to call us to call us back whichever comes first so I hope that you will be reminded of Jesus' kingship and his reclaiming of the throne that man much took away from God we were removed from a theocracy to a monarchy and now Jesus himself has reclaimed it back to a theocracy May we spread it far and wide to every nation and to every ethnic group. Amen.